Okay, we are now recording. Welcome to uh, From Zero to Mario in Two Hours. I'm going to get back to it. Okay. All right. So yes, we will be using version 2020.3.3F1. That is a nice and confusing term, but as long as you match the actual numbers, you're totally fine. And different versions will generally work, but they sometimes change up minor features. So you might see differences in what I'm actually showing you versus what you have. So it's easiest to follow along in the same version that I have. So first thing we're going to do, uh, assumedly, if you guys followed the steps, you will already have done this. But I'm just going to hit new here and make myself a new project in Unity. I'm going to go ahead and choose a 2D game. Uh, Catherine, can you tell me what the difference between a 2D and a 3D game is? Uh, hmm. Well, 2D, I think, only goes forward and backwards. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <up> and down. <laughs> yes. I mean, basically, so a two dimensional game, that's what 2D stands for, is a game that only has, imagine a piece of paper, right? It only has left, right, up and down. It has two dimensions, X axis and Y axis. So when we make a game in two dimensions, we can do that kind of stuff. And the original Mario games are all 2D. So I can walk left, I can jump over Goombas. A three dimensional game, look at this, I even have models for you. It's something that has three dimensions. It has X, Y, and Z. It actually has depth. So our characters are three dimensional and can move along that third axis. In this case, we're going to be building a two dimensional game. For you guys, since you're new to the engine, um, there's not a huge difference in 2D to 3D, but I do find that 2D is generally easier. So I suggest that you start with some 2D tutorials, including this one, before you jump into the world of 3D. All right, so you can name your platformer, as we call it, game whatever you want. It is going to look a lot like Mario right now, but you can always change up the images, etc. in the future. I'm going to go ahead and just call this one Mario again, since I already made it one time. <laughs> Unity is going to take a moment to uh, open up a new project for us. This is totally normal. And one of the drawbacks of using Unity, any of the big game engines, Unreal, Unity, uh, what are some of the other ones? Uh, Cocos 2D. The bigger they are, there are limitations that come with it, including this. The fact that it has to load a whole lot of crap before you have an empty project. So just give it a second and be patient with it, and we will wind up with an empty project that we are ready to actually build into. If it gives you any messages, you can just ignore them. Or, <laughs> wow. Oh no, this is bad. Looks like we have a crash. Hmm. Let's see if it opens anyway. And we have one other person jumping in. Hmm. So it looks like I had, oh, interesting. All right, so let me show you guys. Uh, whenever we have a problem in any kind of uh, engineering capacity, and I say we ran into a bug, that generally means, although it did open, interesting. That generally means that uh, there is a problem. A bug is a problem. And in fact, a fun fact, fun story for you. Um, let me, before I tell you the fun story, I'm going to point out what happened here. For whatever reason, I think I just didn't select the new option here when I hit new. Uh, yeah, look at that. So can you tell, can you guys notice here that I pointed out the version that we're using, 2020.3.3F1, but that it's trying to make a new game in 2020.2? So it's actually trying to use an outdated version of Unity. And we can see here that if I drop this, if I hit this drop down under new, I can pick a different version. So for whatever reason, it made Mario in an outdated version of Unity, which actually seemingly managed to break my game. Um, usually it does not. Usually there's no problem. But this time we got lucky. <laughs> so I'm just going to switch this version to the most recent one and try opening it again. I will hit confirm on that dialog box to say, yes, I want to update it. And hopefully this time we're going to have no problems. So the fun fact while we wait for it to update our version of Unity is where the term bug actually comes from. Does anybody know that one? When we say there is a bug in our code or a bug in our game. So it comes from way back when computers were built out of vacuum tubes and were the size of a room. Uh, you know, when you got a whole bunch of stuff along your walls, that's all that, you know, the most complicated system that I can actually do is like tell you what two plus two is. The first bug, the first computer bug, and where that term comes from was literally a moth. Perfect, great. Was literally a moth that flew into a vacuum tube and burnt it out. And they went and found this dead, melted moth. 
and then uh, fix their program. Okay, so we are here in Unity. Let's go ahead and get ourselves set up. The first thing we're gonna do before building any sort of game is talk about Unity and talk about the layout of Unity and what all these different things are. First thing to know about Unity is that it uses a modular tab and window system, which basically just means I can drag around these different tabs to different parts of my screen. So I could stick my console over there, or I could stick it over there, or I could stick it down here, wherever. Uh, the only reason they do that is so that you can set up your um, version of Unity in a way that feels good and feels right to you. I'm going to ask that unless you are already familiar enough with Unity to do it your way, that you do it my way so that our screens look exactly the same while you are figuring out Mario, okay? So there's gonna be a couple of changes. Yours will probably look at least mostly like mine. The first thing I want you to do is you'll notice in the middle of Unity, there is a scene tab that's currently open and a game tab right next to it. Everybody see that? Scene and game. I'm gonna click and drag your game tab and actually put it to the right hand side of the middle, right next to scene. So this way I can see both my scene and my game at the same time. That is your first task. And if you guys are having any problems, you can feel free to unmute yourself and say like, hey, something's weird. All right, next thing I want you to do is to do the same thing. You'll notice you have a project tab and a console tab. This is probably on the bottom of your screen. I want you to click and drag your console tab to be on the right-hand side of your project tab. And then you can also drag this out because your console wants to be nice and wide and your project doesn't need to be. And then in your project tab, in the top right of all of your windows for that matter, you have a three little dot thing. <laughs> and that is uh, just the options for that tab. I want you to click the option uh, button there for your project and switch from a two column layout to a one column layout. This is more similar to uh, Finder or File Explorer. I think Unity doesn't like it because uh, it does the other one by default because it's nice to be able to see the images, but I find this to be much easier to use, especially for beginners. So that three little buttons, three little dots in the top right of your project tab, switch from two column layout to one column layout. And that's it. We now have Unity all set up and ready to go. Okay. Um, let's see here. One second. I'm trying to figure out where to put your faces so you're not in my way. <laughs> all right. So we're going to start by talking about each of these tabs and what they actually do. And I'm going to ask for some input as we go. So first of all, the scene on this middle left-hand side, our scene tab. Uh, and by the way, you guys can feel free. Uh, download it, set up Unity again on another laptop. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that, Natalie. I will also, bummer. <laughs> I will also send this out as a um, video after the fact to everybody who signed up. So you can hopefully catch up with anything you missed. All right. So uh, yeah, you can feel free to shoot me messages in the chat there. And if anyone notices somebody waiting to get in, um, which I don't even know if you guys can see, but sometimes I won't notice if somebody's waiting to get in. So let me know. Okay, so the scene tab, the scene window. The scene in Unity is kind of like our behind the scenes view of our game. This is where we're gonna be doing the majority of our actual work on what's happening in the game. You will uh, notice that on the left-hand side, there is something called a hierarchy. That is also a window or a tab for us. And the hierarchy is a simplified view, a drop-down view of all of the things that currently exist in the scene. So somebody tell me the only thing that we currently have in our scene. The camera? The camera, yeah, main camera. And you'll notice that when I click on this, a couple of things happen. First of all, we select the camera in our scene. So these two things are directly tied together. Everything that exists here also will exist here. They're the same thing, just with different views. The hierarchy is, let's see everything in a nice ordered list. And the scene is, let's see everything as it's actually laid out. You'll also notice that when I click this one, click the main camera, over in our inspector, a whole bunch of information drops down. 
Everybody see that? So the inspector is uh, one of our more powerful windows. The inspector shows us everything there is to know about the currently selected game object. So in Unity, anything that can exist in your scene, such as our main camera, which has a physical body, you can see, for instance, that I can move this camera around. It has a physical body. Uh, this is called a game object. That's a term that Unity uses. So if you ever see that in your tutorials and it says it's a game object, that just means something that could exist in our scene. So most things are actually game objects. So when I click on any game object in the inspector, I'm going to see all the information there is to know about that game object. So first of all, I can see its transform, which is its position. So you could go ahead and mess with that. Maybe change the X position to 100, and suddenly your camera is way off on the side of the scene and you can't see it anymore. Uh, you can also see under camera here a bunch of information about the camera itself, including the first thing that I would like you to play with in your game, which is the background color. So that second thing there is our background. And if I click that box, I'll actually get a new window with a whole color wheel in it where I can manipulate the color of my background for my game. So I'm making Mario, which is outdoors. I'll make it look a little bit like a real sky as best I can, not a designer. Uh, that looks skyish, right? Perfect, done. So that is my the color I'm going to use in my game. All right. Now, you'll notice uh, this is the first one where I want you guys to guess. Given that we've been manipulating some stuff in our scene and that we're now seeing a color in our game tab, in our game window, what do we think game is? And anyone can feel free to jump in when I ask questions. The game window is like the final, like the, the version that you see the, I don't know, the front version. You're so close. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So here's someone is waiting. Let them let them in. Yeah. So our game window, our game tab, is exactly that. It's the final version of our game. It's what the player is actually seeing. So one of the big revolutionary things that Unity did. One of the reasons that Unity is so popular now. And to give you guys context, the second most popular engine is Unreal Engine. Unity has 65% of new games developed in it. Unreal Engine has 15%. So one of the reasons that Unreal became, excuse me, that Unity became so popular and really blew up is, is this right here. This is what we call a simulator or an emulator. Those are slightly different terms, but you can think of them in the same way. A simulator or emulator shows you what your player would actually experience. So if I started playing my game, it's going to happen right here in the emulator, right inside of Unity. I don't have to put it on my phone or on my Switch or whatever I'm developing for. I don't have to open up an emulator or a simulator. It's right here, ready to go at any moment. It's really powerful. So the game is what our player would actually see and is where we, as the developers, will actually test and play our game. So if this was touchscreen control and there was something for me to click on in my game, I could literally click on it here and it would happen. So that is the incredible power of Unity and what the game window does. Let's talk about our last two windows. Down here in the bottom left is our project. The project is similar to uh, the Photoshop library. That's where anything that we have access to will live. So if we have some images that we're thinking about using in our game but we haven't put in yet, they'll live in the project. And then finally, the console. One of the reasons Unity has this by default, uh, and one of the reasons I have you split this off into its own window is the console is kind of like the nervous system or organs of our game. If there is any kind of problem or issue that our game experiences, it's going to appear in our console. So our console is going to say like, hey, something's broken. And we'll be able to see that in the console, know something is broken and try to fix it. So whenever you're developing, make sure your console is open here so you can see those warnings and you aren't confused about why your game isn't working. OK, so let's actually do some building. I am going to have us start out by just making a couple of squares. So this is going to be a uh, platformer game, right? And a platformer is similar to Mario. It just means I am jumping on platforms. That's typically what a platformer refers to. So in a platformer, we need platforms. So let's add a couple to our game. There are a couple of different ways to do this, but the one I'll show you to start out with is in your hierarchy tab 
on the very top left of that hierarchy tab, underneath where it says hierarchy, there's a plus button. Hit plus. You can see there are many different kinds of things that you can add to your games. But in this case, we're making a 2D game. So we're going to go under 2D. We're making a sprite, which is essentially an image that is a simplified definition. But in video game development, when somebody says sprite, they mostly mean image. And then you can choose what you actually want to add. In this case, I'm going to add some platforms to my game. And why don't you guys start with that too? So I'm going to hit square. And we'll see immediately some things happen. First of all, a square gets added into our hierarchy. We then also immediately see it in our scene. And we immediately see it in our game. We have now added, congratulations, our very first element to our very first video game ever. <laughs> So this square can be manipulated in a bunch of different ways. In the very, very top left of Unity, we'll see our different tools for manipulating objects in our scene and in our hierarchy. The first one there is our hand tool, which just lets us drag around the scene. A hot tip for you is even if you have another tool selected, if you right click, you'll get the hand tool as you're holding that right click. So you can right click and drag your scene even without having to switch to the hand tool. The second tool is our move tool. So if I click on my move tool and then select my square, I can drag this square along one axis by clicking this arrow. So here I am moving it along the y-axis and then the x-axis. Or if I click that square in between the two axes, I can move it around both at the same time, just like clicking and dragging. And we'll notice, by the way, that as I do this, the numbers in my uh, inspector here are being uh, changed in real time. So those numbers directly correlate to where the square actually is. So if I came up here and I changed these numbers to be 0, 0, I put it right back in the middle of my screen. Next tool is my rotate tool. Rotate does what you'd expect. It's got a big circle that you can click and drag along to rotate your square. Next tool, tool is our scale tool. Does also what you'd expect. You can scale along one axis. Or once again, by clicking it in the middle, you can scale along both axes. Next is my Rect tool. This is the tool that I recommend, at least for most of you guys here. Uh, this does the same thing as the Scale tool, except in a different way. You can think of this more akin to what you would experience in Photoshop or uh, like Microsoft Word or Google Docs. You have your four corners that you can click and drag from, just like anything else. And you can hold shift click to make it uh, not change its proportions. So this is what I actually usually use. And extra hot tip from this tool is that if I click and drag in the middle instead of any of the corners, if I click in the middle, I can also move the object. So this tool is actually my favorite tool and what I'm using the majority of the time because it's just so versatile. I can change the scale of things. I can move it around. And unless I actually have to rotate or something, it handles most of what I need to get done. The final tool is called the Insanity Chaos tool. Uh, I don't think that's actually what it's called. It's called Move, Rotate, or Scale Selected Objects tool. <laughs> that's much better. Uh, it actually has all of the tools stuck together in one. I don't know who uses this. And if you run into anybody who does use this, uh, don't trust them because they're not human. <laughs> but basically, it does all the things at once, uh, which if you find that useful, I don't mean to pressure you. You can totally use it. But I find that it just gives you uh, so many options that it mostly doesn't want do what you want it to do. And then the final tool is the editor tool, which you guys don't need to worry about. We're not going to cover it in this class and is more complicated than you will need for a very long time. So as I said, I usually switch to my rect tool. And if your square is totally out of whack after playing with it, in my transform, in my inspector, we'll see a transform here. The transform has three little dots, just like any other tab. If I click that, and I go to reset, it'll reset my square to its default values and its default position. All right. Is everybody following along so far? Give me a thumbs up. Give me clap emojis if your camera isn't on. Fantastic. All right, great. I see some thumbs up from people. Good. I see a clap. Good. All right. So we got a square. Fantastic. All right. So we are going to talk about one other thing before we build some platforms. We're going to talk about what's called component-based programming. Has anybody heard of component-based programming? OK. So this is another, uh, Unity was not the first, were not the first people to do this, but they were the first people to popularize it. 
Um, and it is a really incredibly simple concept that also is incredibly powerful. Um, so traditionally, when I program, let's say a dog or something, I'm gonna write a script called like dog.script and I'm gonna program all the things into the dog. I'm gonna be like, dog knows how to bark and dog knows how to run and dog knows how to get toy and whatever, dog has fur. Um, in a component-based system, instead of doing that, I'm gonna have a object of some kind, a game object, you can tell where this is going, that I will attach individual components to to make that object into a dog. So instead of writing dog.cs, I'm gonna write tail.cs and I'm gonna write fur and I'm gonna write bark or whatever other individual components I might wanna reuse. So if I have my dog, I can slap on some legs, I can slap on a tail, I can slap on fur, I can slap on barking, whatever other things the dog knows how to do, and I have a dog. But I can also take those same scripts, slap them onto a different object and wind up with a cat. So that's why we do component-based programming. And the first thing for you to see here is that even your square is, comp uh, is built of two different components. Given that there are two components building up your square, who can tell me what our components actually are? <laughs> Look in your inspector, that's your hint. There are two components building up your square. And there are also for that matter, two components that build up your camera. And one of those two components is the same between the two of them. It is, <laughs> good job everybody, you did it. So it is the, <laughs> it's totally fine. So it is the transform and the sprite renderer. Those are our two components. So our sprite, is actually just a transform, which given the information that you can see in the transform itself here, what do we think a transform is? Like to change it, manipulate it? Yeah, to change and manipulate position. The transform holds positional information, including our rotation scale and actual position. The second component is our sprite renderer. It is a thing that knows how to render or draw a sprite. And once again, a sprite is an image. So it knows how to draw an image. And you can see actually, in this case, our sprite render, and this is now the next thing that I want you to change, our sprite render has a sprite box that currently has a square in it. If I want to make a platform in my game, I'm gonna first go find a new platform to include in my game. And thankfully, I included a bunch of resources for you guys. So once I move your faces out of the way, there we go. Uh, we can grab some of those assets that I included for you. If you haven't downloaded them already, uh, I have put the link in the chat to get them. But I want you to go ahead and grab the images folder. And inside the images folder, you're going to find this brick PNG. I'm going to get that somewhere onto your machine, and then we're going to import it into Unity. So luckily, importing into Unity is super, super simple. Uh, OK. Just messing with your faces again. If it ever looks like I'm doing nothing, probably I am manipulating your faces a little bit. Um, all right. So in Unity, to import into Unity, it's quite simple. Go and find those objects that you would like to import, in this case, an image. I have it here already ready for me. All you have to do is click and drag and then drop the image into your project folder. So if I click and drag my brick.png right here and I drop it right into my project folder, we'll see that it immediately uh, actually copies that image. We can see that the original image is not removed. And it copies that, Unity, that image into our Unity project and is then available for us to use. Okay, so we can now uh, make our platform look like a brick. So once you have that image in Unity, is everybody uh, has everybody successfully drag and drop an image into Unity? Great. Uh, you can now click and drag your brick from the project 
into this empty, into this box that's currently says square. This is the first way for you to assign what image your sprite uses. Anything that has a sort of black box like that is allowed to be dragged and dropped into. It's another one of the reasons that Unity is so powerful. I can manipulate objects on the fly instead of having to tell it what image to load or something like that. If you're having trouble doing that, you can also hit for any of these boxes where you can drag and drop. There's a little circle on the right hand side. If you click on that little circle, it will show you all of the options available to you in your entire project, which includes this brick. So I can select that. Now we have a brick platform. Does everybody have a brick platform? Great. Okay, so I'm going to make this a little bit smaller. You can choose to make it whatever size you want. Remember that this is your actual game. So this is how much of the world you're going to see in any given moment. All right, I'm going to move this brick into my world and just put it kind of center up to you. And then I'm going to make one more new object. So on the top, I'm going to hit plus. I'm going to go to 2D object. And I'm going to go to sprite. And I'm going to go to square. And this little object is going to become Mario. So first of all, I want you to name this object Mario. You can do so by clicking on it, coming over to the hierarchy, right clicking and hitting rename. Most things allow you to hit to right click and then hit rename. Or alternatively, you'll notice in the inspector, we actually have a name box for it as well. So if I click on this object and come over to the top of the inspector, there is Mario in the very top. I'll just type in Mario. Or in your case, it'll probably say square. And while we're at it, I might as well rename this square because it's not a square, it is a platform. OK. So just like I did before, I'm going to go find Mario, which I have in that same folder. And I'm going to click and drag him into my assets. And if you want to save time for the future, you can uh, click and drag all of the images into my project into your own project. Now that I have Mario, I can click and drag him into my sprite render. And suddenly I have this gargantuan Goliath Mario, who I can make a little bit smaller so that he actually fits my world and my platforms. There we go, looks like Mario. All right, now I want you to place him slightly above your platform. So he's floating in the air. OK, does everybody have Mario and a platform? Can Thumbs, I ask? Uh, yes. Um, when I dragged the Mario to the square, it didn't replace the square. OK. It just. What, what did it do? It just gave me like a Mario, and I still have the, the white square. Uh-huh. Yeah, so what you actually found a hot tip, a hot trick that they added relatively recently, probably six or eight months ago. Um, so you can, instead of having to go through the process of hitting plus 2D object sprite, it actually auto detects that I'm 2D and that this is an image. So if I click and drag this into my scene and let go, it actually immediately makes me a uh, sprite render object, a sprite object with Mario attached. So that'll totally work. That's just fine. The only reason I show you the other way is so that you understand the process of what's actually oh. happening. All right, no worries. You, you can just delete the white square or use that for something else. OK. Yeah. OK. So we have a Mario. We have a platform. Uh, now I want to direct your attention to the top of the Unity window, top middle. You'll notice a play button, a pause button, and a step forward button, a step button. The step button is, once again, more advanced than uh, we'll cover in this class. You don't need to worry about it. But the play button is how we run this magical emulator. So when we hit play, this is actually going to run our game. Our game is now running. Uh, it will take a second to load, and then the game will start. And unfortunately, uh, nothing happened. What the hell? <laughs> so you guys don't know enough yet to know that this is actually totally normal. And this is just because we haven't set up some stuff. So Unity currently thinks that both of our sprites are static, that they don't want anything to happen to them. They don't want to fall. They don't want gravity or anything like that. So they're just going to sit there. This is actually what should happen. But let's fix that. If you would like to stop playing the game, you can hit that play button again. 
And in fact, I'm going to give you guys uh, one more hot industry tip <laughs> before we keep moving. If you notice, my version of Unity switches to a red color when it is running the game. And that's just because I changed that in our preferences. The reason to change it is just to know if my game is currently running or it is not, because strange things will happen when I'm trying to edit things while it is running. So if I hit Unity and I go at the very, very, very top, if I hit Unity and go to Preferences, which might be a little bit different on PC, but if you go to your Unity Preferences, you'll see that under General, uh, not under General, under Colors, in the middle-ish, a little bit towards the top, there's a play mode tint. This is the color that your Unity will take on when you are actually running the game. So I recommend you change that to something more vibrant than just this sort of dark gray that they have so that it's very clear for you to know if you are currently running your game or not. Just a good debugging tool, good tool to know what's going on with your game. All right, everybody good there so far? Two thumbs way up. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. I don't know. What is uh, the, the third guy with video on? I can't see your name. What is, uh, what is your name? Talking about Kevin? Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Not you, it but hi, Kevin. <laughs> or, oh, wait, it is Kevin? I have the Zoom on my phone and my computer. Uh, gotcha. Hi, Kevin. Nice to see you. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Kevin. I'm going to force you, now that I know your name, you're doomed, and I'm going to make you answer questions and stuff. Okay. Cool. <laughs> so we have our game all set up to add some physics. Now, one of the other, I, you can see that I'm a big fan of Unity. One of the other things that is wonderful about Unity is that it has many, many, many built-in components ready for you to use. Remember that all of our objects are component-based, and that the way, the principle, the idea of a component is that I want something for my object, such as fur or a tail, and I slap that onto my object. In this case, we want physics for our object. We want Mario to fall. So I'm going to click on Mario. And in the inspector, we'll see that towards the bottom, it says add component. So click that. And I want you to search for rigid body 2D. I want you to find and add a rigid body 2D to Mario. All right, so you can see that I added it and then it is a big old component. There's lots of stuff under it. If your components are getting overwhelming, whenever you see a little triangle like this, like you can see right next to rigid body 2D, little tiny triangle, whenever you see that in Unity, that is an indication that you can collapse stuff. So if I click that, we'll see that the rigid body is suddenly a lot smaller. So I can expand or, or collapse that. Okay, so this is actually, we're done now. This is the magic of Unity. Mario now has physics. If we hit play, once it finishes loading, and Unity does take a second to load, uh, crap. Well, that didn't quite work either. <laughs> so we successfully told Mario to fall. We successfully said, hey, Mario, we want physics to happen to you, including gravity. And, and he listened. It worked. The component worked. But there's a problem, which is what? He didn't fall on the platform. <laughs> yeah. So the, the platform uh, doesn't have any kind of physics. So yes. it's just kind of an image there. Yeah. So you are you're half right. You are you're correct, but we actually don't need a rigid body is the only part of that that uh, is different from what you're thinking. The rigid body does tell us that we want physics, but we don't need that for collision is what we actually need. Collision means two things will run into each other and something with a rigid body like Mario uh, as long as he has a collider, we'll know how to collide into other stuff with a collider. So what we actually need to do is to both Mario and our platform, we need to add a collider. So let's start with our platform because it's a simpler collider. So on your platform, I want you to hit add component and go find yourself a box collider 2D. Now you'll notice that when I brought up the rigid body and this box collider, there's a box collider and there's a box collider 2D. Given that there's a box collider 2D, what do you think the regular box collider is? 3D. 3D, yeah. yeah. So yeah, 3D. So we're in 2D, let's use 2D. If you use a 3D one, it will do weird stuff and you'll be super confused. So make sure to try to always remember to do an actual 2D one. Um, the reason for that, this is another fun Unity fact, 
is uh, this actually was built for exclusively 3D games at first. And then they started noticing a lot of people building 2D games and they started supporting it. So there was a collider before there was ever a collider 2D. All right, now Mario also needs a collider. If I hit play here, he will actually still fall through this, uh, fall through this platform. And that's because the Unity developers who created this assume that you might want something to respond to physics, but not run into stuff. You know, maybe you have, I don't know, some air particle or something like that. So he still needs his own collider. Now, we're not going to use a box collider for him. We're going to use what's called a capsule collider. Capsule Collider 2D. So go ahead and add a Capsule Collider 2D. Now you'll see that on your platform and on Mario, if you switch which one you're selecting, you have a faint green line around the edge of it. And Mario, it's much more noticeable because it isn't perfect. So this faint green line is indicating the actual collider. If I turn Mario here and I hit play, and then he falls and hits that platform, we'll see that he actually impacts where that green line is. So Unity is actually doing some math here to determine if those two colliders, and sorry to keep moving this down, it's because Zoom's in the way. So uh, here, maybe I can move it over there. Perfect. All right. Um, so uh, this collider, it's actually doing some math to determine if Mario's collider is running into the platform's collider and any other collider in the universe. Oh boy, that's not what I meant. Hold on here. Oh god. I just wanted to get rid of the rotation. Uh, there we go. All right. So this collider is a little bit too wide on his left and right. Now, because you guys are just starting out, this isn't that big of a deal. You're just building a game that works. But just to show you, remember that in your inspector, there are tons of things to change about any individual component. So we can see that in our size here for a capsule collider, the x value and the y value can be changed independently. So given that our uh, Mario seems to have too much width, what do we need to change, the x or the y? The x. Yeah, the x. So let's make the x a little bit smaller. And now we can see what a capsule collider actually is. A capsule collider has a round top and a round bottom and straight sides. Uh, so it is really, really useful for making humanoid shapes because it generally fits the shape of the human body, like you can see here, um, without having to get too complicated. There are more complicated colliders that will perfectly match the edge of Mario. Um, but the problem with that is you start to have to use a very powerful machine to run that kind of emulation. So uh, this will get us just enough collision without getting too complicated. OK, so we now have a Mario who will fall and land on the platform. Instead. My Mario goes through the platform Son as well. Of a... <laughs> so probably one in either your platform or your Mario do not have colliders, or one of those colliders is not a 2D collider. They are 2D colliders, correct. And both the platform and Mario have a collider? Yes. Huh. Interesting. OK. Why don't we do some live bug fixing? So Kevin, you can hit in the bottom of your screen, share screen, and you should be able to share. And we'll all check out what's happening and try to fix it for you. All right. There you see this, right? <laughs> yep, perfect. OK, so we have a Mario. Yep. And everybody can see that Mario has a rigid body 2D and he has a capsule collider 2D. And then if we look at our platform, great, thank you, Kevin. We have a box collider 2D, great. I know what the problem is, but I'll tell you about it in a second. Uh, if you hit play, what happens? Ah, shit. <laughs> so yeah, so this is sort of interesting and a great point for everyone to know about. If you hit play here, uh, there is one small difference. Uh, I just meant you, to, you can stop playing. Yeah. There's one small difference between your uh, between Mario's collider and the platform's collider. Can you tell what it is? Besides the fact that they are different shapes. It is that it's a trigger. Yep. Any idea what a trigger is? It activates when something passes by. Yep. Yeah. If you hit play now, what happens? Nice. Uh -huh. So you can stop sharing the screen here. I'll talk about the trigger as you do so. Um, so yes, a trigger is an alternate form of a collider. Um, and unfortunately, I'm, I'm not actually sure why they didn't just write them as two separate scripts. I kind of think they should. 
But when you want to make a trigger, you have to add a collider and then you hit is trigger. The main reason or use of a trigger in a video game would be like, I want to activate the big bad boss fight when I walk into this room. So I can put a trigger in the doorway so that when Link or whoever walks through that doorway, we know that he walked through the doorway, but there isn't like a wall in his way. There isn't an actual collider. So the trigger is a way for us to know that a collision happened without having like a physical body in the way. So that's all that happened. If you ever have, uh, pay attention to these bugs because you will inevitably run into them. So if you ever have a collider that seems to not be colliding, check to see if you accidentally set it to be a trigger. Okay, so we have a Mario who falls and lands on this platform. Now, let's see here. We are, I'm just checking to see where we are in time and see what makes sense to do next. Okay. So let's uh, let's keep going for now. Yeah, let's keep going. Let's add some platforms to our level. This, I'm going to give you like three, four minutes to just play around with this as you may. I want you to make yourself some kind of a level for Mario to explore. So we've got some platforms. Uh, to duplicate any platform in your scene, you can select it and hit Command D on Mac or Control D on PC. You can also definitely copy and paste, uh, or you can right click and go to duplicate. So I'm just going to make a couple platforms, move around a little bit so Mario can jump between them. If you put them right next to each other, he'll be able to walk over them. Put some up here, maybe. Just make yourself a cool looking level. And Mario is going to be able to jump and move as fast and as high as you want, because you're the game developer. So if you want to put a platform way up there, do it. <laughs> OK. Make a couple more platforms. In our game, um, by the way, the, the way that I do these courses, because there is so much to do with people who haven't experienced it before, we just kind of get as far as we can. And then I give you enough resources to hopefully keep doing it on your own time. So uh, as I talk and as I show stuff off, some of those things we may not get to, but we'll do our best. Uh, the elements that we have planned to get to today are a, uh, an enemy that can kill Mario, a coin that you can pick up, and a flag that if you touch, you win the game. And then Mario himself in the platforms. All right. So I added a couple platforms in to give you just like one more minute. It doesn't need to be pretty. You can always keep playing with this after the fact. Okay, so let's keep going with this. Um, I have included many, many scripts for you. A maybe intimidating amount of scripts. This is the most scripts I have ever included for a Unity course, uh, for one of our two hour courses. That's because platforms are fairly complicated. But I've done it in a way so that hopefully these are reusable and every one of these scripts has many, many comments in them, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, to hopefully help you understand them when you look at them later. What I'd like you to do, and you won't have to do this weird thing that I'm doing here, but what I'd like you to do is uh, grab all of the scripts that are included in your script folder. Um, I'm actually, oh no, this works. And drag and drop them into your project, just like you would an image. Unity is going to take a second to compile them, and then you'll have all of your scripts. And by the way, it pays to be organized in this uh, profession. So in your project, you can always hit plus, and you'll see the very top option is folder. Uh, and I like to have a very simple uh, organizational system until my games get really complicated, where I just label what kind of thing is in this folder. So I just made an images folder. I'm going to hit plus folder. I'm going to make myself a scripts folder. I can drag and drop all my scripts into that folder as well. So grab all of the scripts that I included for you and drop them into your project. OK, does everybody have a bunch of scripts? Oh, one more thing to say. It is way more valuable for me to know that you are currently behind than it is for me to know that you are very behind in half an hour. <laughs> so, you know, one small thing that I have to fix, great. If I have to catch you up from half an hour of stuff that you didn't know about, very bad. Uh, very difficult for me to do while other people are learning. 
So if you're having any kind of problems, best for me to know about it sooner than later. I'm gonna make my platforms a little prettier while you guys are doing that. Perfect, amazing. Natalie, did you manage to get uh, Unity downloaded? Yep, I'm making my platforms. Yay, the, great. The sprites and stuff are just an empty object with the sprite renderer, right? Yeah, so you can okay. do it that way, that's great. Um, but to save you some time, you can also go to 2D object sprite and then uh, square or whatever. Um, you can also, when you grab my assets, this is another uh, sort of uh, faster way to do things. You can just drag that image straight into the scene and it will automatically make a sprite with the Yeah, image I noticed attached. that the, the images were already registered as sprites. I didn't have to turn them into sprites. Yep. <laughs> that was Unity. nice. Unity is very smart until it's not, and then it gets really frustrating, but mostly it's awesome. <laughs> okay. So Natalie, if you are, uh, did you, do you have like a platform with a collider and do you have a Mario with a collider and a rigid body 2D? Yep. Amazing, you're doing great. Thank you for catching up. Um, so let's add those scripts then. So if you haven't already, Natalie, you can grab all the scripts that I included and drop them into your project. For everybody else, let's go ahead and start making Mario smart. So you will see that in our scripts folder, we have many different scripts. There are uh, a couple of them that we're going to have to attach to Mario to make him work. Um, just given the name of these scripts, can anybody guess which ones we're about to attach to him? There are two that we're going to attach to first. Jumper and mover. Jumper and mover. Yeah, he's a character that knows how to move and jump. Pretty simple. So on Mario, you have two options. You can either hit add component and you can actually search for jumper and you'll notice that my custom script that I wrote is actually right here available for you, just like the built-in ones. So whenever you write a script in Unity, this is not always the case, um, but many, much of the time, a lot of the time, when you write a script, it's actually its own custom component that is then available for you to attach to other stuff. So that's why I'm not gonna write a Mario script. Instead, I'm gonna write a jumper script because maybe I want an enemy who knows how to jump later or something like that. All right, so I have a jumper. So you can go ahead and hit add component, search for jumper and add it. Or alternate option is just to click and drag. So I can click and drag my mover from my project over here into the inspector on Mario. And if I let go, it will totally not work. I thought that worked. <laughs> let me try that again and make sure I didn't mess it up. Yeah, that doesn't work. All right, so I guess you have to hit add component and go to mover. All right. So hit add component in Mario's inspector and add a jumper and a mover. Okay, and now you can play Mario. So if I hit play and I use the arrow keys, where it's space, crap, nothing happens. Just kidding, I planned this. Okay, so we have Mario <laughs> and he has a jumper and a mover, but he doesn't currently work. Now we're gonna spend just a second looking at the code of the uh, jumper to try to understand why he doesn't work yet. So whenever you wanna open up a script, you can just double click on it and it will open your preferred script editor. There are many of them out there. Um, I prefer to use, is it opening? There it is. I prefer to use Visual Studio. Visual Studio is, um, which tab are we in right now? Put it over there. Visual Studio is Unity's built-in uh, script engine. So if you install everything correctly, you probably already have Visual Studio and it's already opening. Um, if it is not already opening, whatever script editor you have right now is perfectly good for now. Uh, but Visual Studio is the one that I recommend because it has the best parity with Unity. It does a lot of really nice stuff, even though uh, it does uh, have some limitations. You know, Every tool has limitations. So when you double click the jumper, does everybody have our jumper open now? In one program or another, are they looking at jumper? Okay. So to the uninitiated, those who have not scripted before, code can look very scary <laughs> and that's okay. Code is a little bit scary. It has a lot going on. Um, but there, as you start to understand it more and more, it becomes less and less scary. And then one of the things that's very comfortable about code is that computers are 100% predictable. 
unless a rogue photon shoots into a computer box and just barely manages to hit a specific bit and flip it, which can actually happen, uh, but astronomically low likelihood, a computer will always do the thing that you would expect. So in coding, even though it can sometimes be frustrating, and this is where I'm going to ask you guys to be patient, um, it is always understandable as you start to get used to it. I feel like I was making games for a full year before suddenly it clicked and I was like, oh, code. So don't get too frustrated. Take it slowly. Do whatever is comfortable for you. And this one is silly and some other engineers might get upset with me for saying this to you. But write code in a way that makes sense to you to get things to work. You do not have to worry about being efficient right now. You do not have to worry about writing really pretty code. You don't have to worry about, you know, writing the best code that can do the best things. Just get it to work right now. And once you get things to work, then you can start to delve into the, the best ways to do things. Okay. So we're going to talk for just a second about this first piece of code, and then we're going to write our own. So first of all, if we look at the very top of this class, uh, we can ignore this part for now. Anytime you write a piece of code in Unity, it's going to automatically stick those in. And until you get a little bit more complicated, you don't need to worry about them yet. At the very top, oops, at the very top of your class, you'll see that it says public class jumper colon mono behavior. So our public and our class terms are once again things that you don't need to worry about quite yet. I know that can be frustrating because you're like, I just I want to know what the hell that means. But in script, there is enough to understand that it's sometimes more useful to just be like, that's something I'll learn later. So for now, don't worry about those. Except know that this is indeed a class. Jumper.cs is a class. It is both a script and a class. In Unity and in most programming languages, when somebody says a class, that just means a specific script that can be used and referenced. So Jumper is a class. Now, uh, this middle term is its name. So we have named this thing jumper. It is a jumper. And this last term here is what is it what it is inheriting from, which you don't really need to know about yet, but we will talk about at some point in the future. The next most important thing to know about scripts is colons, is uh, brackets, I should say. So we'll notice that there are brackets all over our script. There are opening brackets and there are closing brackets. And if we're usually using Visual Studio, if I click on any bracket, we'll notice that it always highlights another bracket with us. Can anybody guess why? Uh, it's the, the beginning and the end of that specific um, code. Yes. So remember that computers are absolute. They are exact. Computers don't go, mm, OK, so they must mean this. They need to know exactly when something starts and exactly when it ends. So a bracket is something that just says, hey, whatever was right before this, all of the stuff inside of my opening and closing brackets are a part of it. So for our public class jumper, we can see that we have one opening bracket and one closing bracket for the entire class. So all of this, everything inside of the opening and closing bracket is a part of our jumper class. Make sense? Now there are other things that use brackets, including functions. So when you see this public void jump or this void start, that is a function. It is a specific uh, piece of logic that does one thing. In this case, this uh, function starts and this function jumps. And we can see that this also has an opening and a closing bracket. So all of this is a part of the jump function. Make sense? So brackets are just for organization. And when we start to write our own script, it's going to make even more sense. You'll also see that I have lots of actually like readable text in my scripts for you guys, all uh, behind these two lines here. So whenever we have two backslashes, this is uh, C-sharp specifically, but most programming languages have some way to do this. Uh, this is a comment. So this will get completely ignored by the compiler, completely ignored by the script. And it will basically be as if it was like this. That comment is only there for you guys to read. So hopefully a way for you to investigate the script that I have prepared for you in a way that's a little bit more understandable than just a bunch of code. OK, so let's just look for now at the functions that are in jump. So right now we have two functions. What are the two functions that are in our jumper?
start and jump. Start and jump. Yeah. Remember I said that this is how you have a good indication of a function. So we have a start function and we have a jump function. So this thing knows how to start and it knows how to jump. Now start is a special function in Unity. It gets automatically called when this thing first exists. So this is just kind of like our setup. When I first add Mario to the game and hit play, all of his start functions on all of his components are going to get called. So if there's something special that I need to do in our uh, start function, if there's something special that I need to do in my script at the beginning of the game, I would put it in start. So we can kind of ignore start and we'll see it in a lot of other places too. This is mostly just setup. You can actually add this yourself because I didn't add it. Mostly just setup happens at the beginning of the game. So do two backslashes and then type whatever you want. So the other function that it has is jump. If I look at jump, it's going to do some stuff that we don't need to talk about yet. But basically, the jump function actually makes this thing jump. Now, we have a jump function and we have a start function. But does anybody see in here when we actually jump? The way you would know that is if you saw this sitting by itself. This is what we have a deck. This is what we call a declaration. This is actually creating the function so that the function knows what to do. This is actually using the function. This means, okay, now I want Mario to jump. So do we see that anywhere in here? Yeah, right next to public void versus. Yeah, so this is, once again, if we have public void and then our brackets, that's the declaration. So that's the definition of jump. That's us saying what will happen when we jump, but it's not us actually jumping. This is us actually jumping just by itself, jump sitting there. Oh, so it wasn't there before, is that what you mean? Yeah, mm -hmm. I just put that there, yeah, as an example. So oh. we actually don't. Jumper never tells itself to jump, which explains why Mario is not currently jumping. Something needs to actually call that function or use that function. Something needs to actually say, hey, Mario, I want you to jump. So we actually have to write that ourselves. So I've done it. Uh, this is a little bit different from last time. So you'll see that at the top of your scripts, you have a completed coin, a completed flag, and a completed player controller. These are the final versions of scripts that we might write today. The one we're definitely going to write is our player controller. So if you need to look at a completed version of the script we're about to write, you can open up your completed player controller and see everything that's in here. This is for you guys to look at as we're writing if you get lost or something like that. Um, and also something for you to look at after class, especially if for some reason your player controller doesn't work or whatever, or you're lost. Hopefully it's just an extra resource for you to understand. But we're gonna write our own player controller first. A, a controller is a uh, type of script that we often use to mean basically, this is the head honcho that's calling the shots. So this is the thing that's actually going to tell the jumper when it should jump, right? So in our scripts folder, I'm gonna hit my plus button. This is in my project in Unity itself. In my scripts folder, I'm gonna hit my plus button. I'm gonna go down to C sharp script and I'm gonna click it. You'll see that it will create a new script and I will immediately have the name highlighted. So I want you to name this thing player controller. And you'll notice that my P is uppercase and my C is uppercase. In coding, syntax matters. Syntax really matters. Uh, it will not break your game, but other engineers will be upset with you. And later you might be confused as you get better at coding if you don't follow syntax. Uh, and in many cases for that matter, syntax will literally break your game. So whenever you make a new uh, script, I always want you to uppercase the first word, and I always want you to have no spaces, and I always want you to uppercase any other word after that. This is what we call upper Pascal case. This means the first letter of every word is uppercase, including the first one. So player controller. And if I double click my player controller, we will see this now open in a nice, fresh, empty script. Bum, bum, bum. Here comes the scary part, the engineering.
Wait, before you begin, um, yes. Yes. can I ask how how can I set um, the script to open in a different program? I downloaded uh -huh. the Visual Studio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is up in your preferences, I believe. Um, yes, so I'm under Unity preferences, yeah. go to external tools and you'll yeah. see at the very, very top, there's external script editor. You can click mm -hmm. that and uh, hit browse and then go and find your Visual Studio, select that. Oh, got it, thank you. Yep, no problem and whatever other script uh, editor you guys want to use. Another one, if you're like, for some reason, really don't like Visual Studio, another one that I really like uh, that is at least free to use, although it has a really annoying message about how you should buy it sometimes. Um, but one that I recommend that is mostly free to use is Sublime Text. So for Unity, I would recommend Visual Studio. If for some reason you don't like that or it doesn't work, go for Sublime Text. OK. So we have our empty player controller. Now, uh, a common gotcha that I want to point out here before we move uh, any further is that this is because Unity is just so massive at this point, there are many like little eccentricities that can trip you up. And one of them is renaming scripts is a huge pain in the ass. <laughs> so if I, for some reason, messed up my player controller, well, I'll just show you guys this example. I have my player controller in my project. We can see player controller. If I hit enter on this and rename it to player control, for some reason, I don't know, I wanted to name it that. If I double click this, we'll see that it's still named player controller inside of the script itself. And if I tried to use this script, if I hit add component and I go try to find player controller, I, it's, it isn't even there. And that's because the name of the file, which is what we're seeing in the project, and the name of the class, which is what we're seeing inside of the script, are different. And so it's confused and lost and doesn't know what to do. So you have to make sure that the name of the class inside of the script itself and the name of the file, the thing in the project, are exactly the same. And if you ever change them, you have to change them in both places. So I'm going to change that back, and then I'm going to double click this. And we'll see player controller is open. And once it opens up, hello? Uh, hello? Player controller is being reluctant. Let's try that again. Hold on. There we go. And once it opens up, we have it here named correctly in the class. OK, so let's do some jumping. We're going to start by jumping. Uh, we'll notice, by the way, that we start with two empty functions. What functions are they? like start an update. Start an update, yeah. So there are a couple of ways that we can tell that something is a function. First of all, we have our brackets. Now, not all brackets mean function. We can even tell, right? Class, our class player controller is not a function. It is a class. It is the parent. Um, but it has brackets. So brackets don't necessarily mean function. But this parenthesis right here is a, is a dead giveaway. After a name, if you have two parentheses, that means this is definitely a function. And once again, a function is a discrete piece of code that does one thing, does one function. In this case, we have our start up uh, start method, which I already told you what that is. Who can remind me what a start method does? It activates like once it starts. Yep, activates at the very beginning of the game, just one time. Uh, so this is kind of for our update, or excuse me, <laughs> this is kind of for our like setup. Um, and by the way, if I use the term method, that is an interchangeable word with the term function. So if I ever say method, that just means function. So this is a method or a function. Uh, and then we have one other method or function called update, which uh, Unity has some built-in comments there to tell you what that means. Who can guess what an update does? Constantly runs. Yep, so this is happening. Uh, usually Unity's default is running at about 60 frames per second. So anything that's inside of update is going to happen around 60 times a second. This is useful for a lot of different stuff, actually, and we're going to use it today. So our player controller needs a couple of things. The first thing that it needs is a way to talk to our jumper. They are two separate scripts. This is one of the drawbacks of a component-based system. 
Before, if I was using uh, the, the, by the way, the main alternative way to a component-based system is called an object-oriented language, an object-oriented system. And that means I would make the whole dog, right? In this case, it's component-based where I'm making pieces of the dog. So in this case, I have two parts of Mario. I have the player controller, the thing that actually is controlled by the player, and I have my jumper. And I need those things to communicate, right? The jumper knows how to jump, but it doesn't know when to jump. The player controller is going to tell us when to actually jump. So we need to actually connect those two things. The most primitive way to connect two scripts is to make a reference variable. So we're going to write our very first piece of script now. So on line six, after our opening bracket, I want you to make a new line. So we've got a nice, fresh, empty line here. And in that new, fresh, empty line, let me make this a little bit bigger, I want you to write public uh, jumper, jumper with a lowercase j. And actually, let's make this more clear. Why don't you call that my jumper? And we'll notice that when I type variables, this is a variable, I have a lowercase first letter. This is an example of syntax that won't break your game. But once again, it is very useful for many reasons, just trust me, to keep your syntax the same. This is what we call a camel case, which means the first letter is lowercase. And then the first letter of every word after that is uppercase. So if it was like my awesome jumper, awesome would also be uppercase. But in this case, let's just call it my jumper. OK. So we had three words here to make this reference variable. The first word is what's called our accessibility. I'm throwing a lot of terms at you, but I'm hoping that you guys can learn enough to come back to this and keep playing with this uh, game, make it awesome. And you can always, uh, in a day or two, I'll be sending you the recorded version of the class. So you can always come back and check things out. And then I'll give you contact information at the end. So if you need to reach out, you absolutely can. Uh, but an accessibility is just how other people can interact with this thing. A public variable is accessible to everyone. We're not going to talk about any of the other ones today. So all of our variables today are going to be public. The next word is the type of variable this is. There are many, many, many variables out there. Does anyone know what an integer is? You do not need to type this. This is an example. Whole numbers. Yep. So an integer is a whole number. So I could actually have a variable that is just an integer. Uh, and I could set that equal to 10 or whatever the heck I want. right? So this is a variable of the type integer. And my jumper is a variable of the type jumper. So what we've done, if we now save this script and we come back to Unity, and then, uh, by the way, if this is where you really want to watch your console, if you see anything pop up in your console, let me know. Hopefully not yet, because you only added one line. <laughs> but there will be many of them, and don't be afraid. It's better to figure them out. And the more times you run into those problems, the easier they will be to figure out. So on Mario, what I'd like you to do now is go ahead and add that player controller. So I'm going to hit Add Component in the inspector while I'm selecting Mario. And I'm going to search for player controller. And you'll see that the player controller gets added. And then there is one empty box. What is that empty box called? My Would it be jumper. the argument? My jumper. Yeah. That's the variable we just freaking made. <laughs> so we just made ourselves a custom component. And we made a custom component with something that we can edit in the inspector, just like all these other components that we have uh, seen so far. So given that this is supposed to be a jumper, and that currently it says none, but it's, it's one of those boxes that we're allowed to drag and drop into, what do you think we have to do to let the player controller know about the jumper? Assign it. Yep, we drag and drop. So here is one more big gotcha. What I'm going to do, this is what I want you to do. In the inspector on Mario, I want you to click and drag that jumper component. And you'll see that if I click and drag it, I can actually drag this uh, mono behavior. You can see that's what it says on my mouse. And I can drop that into that box. And we'll see that it now says Mario jumper. The player controller now knows about this jumper. 
So I'm going to do that first, and then I'm going to tell you the gotcha. Drag and drop from the actual bar itself at the top where it says jumper. Drag and drop that guy and drop it into the empty box that says my jumper. OK. So the really common gotcha here that throws a lot of people off is they think that they have to grab the jumper script from their project. That is wrong. Don't do that. Do not grab the script itself from the project. The difference here, uh, actually, can anybody guess why that's wrong? Anybody know why that's wrong? Because the script on the side is not applied to anything yet? That's true. That is definitely true. Uh, the other part of that is this player controller is not, it doesn't want to talk to any jumper. It's not, it's not like, yeah, it's like, cool, let me talk to that jumper over there from that Goomba. It wants to know about Mario's jumper. It wants Mario to jump. And this is Mario's jumper right there. So if any other jumper were in that slot, it would be incorrect. It would be wrong because we don't want a Goomba to jump. We want Mario to jump when we hit space, right? So drag and drop the jumper from Mario themselves into this empty box. Um, can okay. you show us how to do that within the script itself? Uh, what do you mean? <laughs> like within the um, the player controller script, you'd be able so you, to. Uh, uh, how to write it or how to assign it from here? Like assign it from there. So you actually can't. You have to come into the inspector. So in Unity development, you go back and forth a little bit. Um, for more, for you to get a little bit more advanced, you can come back and look at this part of the video later if you want. You'll notice that in the jumper, we have private rigid body and private ground detector. And if we look in the inspector, uh, the jumper does not have a ground detector or a rigid body. And that's because these things are private. They cannot be seen in the inspector. And we then use this line of code to automatically find that rigid body for us. So that's better, but more complicated. So if you would like, come back to this video later, come back to this section later, look at it, try to understand that. But for now, we're going to do the simplest form, which is a public jumper in which case you have to come to the inspector and drag and drop that jumper from Mario into that empty box. OK? Everybody have an attached jumper? Does anybody need help? Yeah, I need help. <laughs> What's going on, Catherine? I don't see where I can add uh, under player control. Mm -hmm. I don't have it say my jumper. Yeah. Where did you so that's probably because there's, so that is definitely because there's something wrong in your script. Okay. So we'll see if I delete this line, for instance, and I come back, once it finishes loading that, this, that the script has changed, we'll see that my jumper disappears under player controller. You have okay. To and, okay. Uh, and if I were to delete something and come back, we can see that it will not have the empty box and there's an error in my console. Do you see any errors in your console? Me, no. Oh, OK. Kevin? I was saying, um, did you save the script? Yeah, that is the other thing that you can check. Uh, the Visual Studio, at least, and I'm not sure what you're using here, does not automatically save your scripts. And if you don't save the script, the change will not be reflected in Unity. Mm-hmm. OK. So you can hit. Uh, Command S on Mac or Control S on PC see. when you actually have it open. Okay. You can Let also me see if it's saved. File save. Are you using Visual Studio? Oh, yeah. no. So okay. how do I reload when I save it? Uh, the uh, script? You, you don't need to reload. Unity will automatically do that for you when you come back to Unity. I don't think it did. My, uh, my player control isn't updated. Hold okay. On, let me see. So let's, why don't you share your screen for a second? And we'll try to oh, I can't out. share from here. I have my, oh, I'm on no. another computer. Yeah, it's all okay. good. Let me see if I can open it. Sure. Uh, oh, okay. I hit re a reset thing mm -hmm. and then now it shows up. Okay, great. Oh yeah, okay. Now it's, uh, let me go back to Mario. And he's got an empty jumper here. Now I have it. Yes. I had to reset 
something. Okay. I don't know what that is, but I'm glad you figured it out. <laughs> I usually just click around and see. <laughs> What's funny is I, I feel like the students that I have never had before that are like totally fresh wind up like teaching me more things than I ever have learned anywhere else. Like there will be some <laughs> weird problem that I've never seen in my entire life. I don't know, like 15 years of game development now uh, that you guys run into on day one. I don't know how, but you managed to do it. <laughs> All right. So we have a jumper and we have it attached to our player, uh, in the inspector. So let's actually use that jumper now. So what we're going to do, the reason that the jumper doesn't actually do anything right now is because we aren't telling it to actually jump. We aren't actually using that function. We aren't calling that function, which means actually telling that function to run, to do something. When in a game of Mario, would Mario actually jump? When you press jump. When you press jump, which button should be used for jumping? Space. Yeah, probably space. It's up to us though. So what I want us to do is inside of the update in our player controller. And when I say inside of, that means it has to be inside of the opening and closing bracket. I want you to write a line. And it's going to look a lot like a lot of stuff at first, but I'll explain it. So I want you to write if parentheses. And remember that besides white spaces, white spaces do not make a difference to the to code to computers. So besides spacing and tabs and all of that, you need to write it exactly like I write it. Even in uppercase will mess things up. Okay. So I'm going to say if input dot get key down parentheses key code dot space. And then after that line on a whole new line, I want you to make an opening and a closing bracket. If input dot get key down key code dot space. Okay, so I'm going to start talking a little bit, but you can feel free to take your time and type this all out. Um, I'm going to talk about what an if statement is or a conditional. Does anybody already know what an if statement is or a conditional? Um, I do. Okay, I saw Natalie's hand first. So Natalie, let's hear it. You're on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um... That's okay. So as a, a conditional statement, uh, it has something that a condition that it checks to see if it should uh, execute whatever you put in the, the block or the then statement. Okay, so one of my fundamental beliefs in the world is that we need to celebrate ourselves and each other because nobody else is going to do it. So Natalie. That is amazing. Thank you. Yeah. So a conditional is just as long as whatever is true, I'm going to do the things. So I'm gonna, you don't need to write what I'm about to write. I'm just gonna do this as an example. If I have an int, which is once again, a variable, a number that does not have decimal places, I have an int called example, and that int equals five. And then I say example plus equals three, which is just shorthand to add to it. My example is then gonna be eight, right? When I get down to here, let's actually use this. My example is then going to be eight, right? Once I get to here, example is eight. Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, script reads horizontally, uh, excuse me, reads vertically down. It reads line by line. So first it's going to say, okay, cool. We're making a new variable called example and we're setting it equal to five. And that's going to go to this line. There's nothing there. It doesn't care about white space. It's going to keep going. It says, okay, and now I'm going to take example and I'm going to add three to it. And then it's going to skip a line. And that's going to get to here. And this is a very useful function. Basically, this literally prints down to the console, literally types out stuff to the console. So this is then going to print out 8. 5 plus 3 equals 8. So here is where it gets interesting. I can now say if example is greater than 10, example plus equals 5. So now, if you had to guess, what is the example going to be when it prints out? Eight. Still eight. 
Why? That statement is false. Yeah, this statement is false. Currently, example at this point in time is going to be eight. And eight is not greater than 10. So this is going to get completely skipped. And it's just going to go down here and print out the eight. So now what if I did this? What is example going to be when we log it? Five. More than that. <laughs> oh, actually it's 10. More than that. Nope. Oh, it's <laughs> eight plus five. Indeed, <laughs> 13. 13, nailed it. Third time's the charm. Uh, yeah, so it's gonna wind up being 13. So it starts out as five, it adds three. It asks, is eight less than 10? It says, yes, it is, great. Then we're gonna do everything inside of our brackets. So eight plus five again, and this time it's going to wind up being 13. So that is a conditional, incredibly simple tool, but incredibly powerful tool. So all we're doing here, if you had to guess, I know there's a lot of jargon going on, but you now know what an if statement does and you know what update does. It happens 60 times a second. So what are we actually doing here? We are determining if the space key was pressed. That's it, yeah. If the space key gets pressed, do some stuff in here. If the space key doesn't get pressed, we're just gonna keep going. So what we're doing here is writing our input. So let's actually use that input. We're gonna start by teaching you one of the simplest and most valuable things in the world, which is debug.log. Debug.log is super, super useful for uh, debugging, for trying to figure out why stuff is not working. And it's also useful to do a classic programming challenge called Hello World. Hello world is uh, something you guys may have run into before. And it's basically just the very first thing that I want to see printed out to my console is the term hello world. That's how I very first approach programming and learn about how I can do things in it. So whenever I debug.log something written just like this, debug.log with an uppercase L, and then the uh, uh, parentheses, and finally finished off with a semicolon, uh, generally, this unfortunately is not always true, but 99.9% .9 of the time, my lines are either going to end, a literal, like a line, here's line 18, is going to end by either having an opening bracket or with a semicolon. And that's how the compiler knows that the line is done and I should move on. So because we are not using a bracket here, we're going to use a semicolon. Uh, and then I'm going to type whatever the heck I want to print to the console in some parentheses inside of that, uh, inside of that parentheses. So if everyone has typed this, I want you to pop over to Unity and hit play. Oops, and hit play. And you'll see now that if I hit space, we can see in the console, it is printing out hello world. Does everybody have hello world printing when they hit space? Anybody need help here? We just leave that up for a second. Hold on to me. <laughs> sure. <laughs> We're going to get rid of this line in a second anyway. This is just oh. for you to get it working. Just so you can see that your space button works. Okay. If you had, so you're not using Visual Studio? Me, no. Mm -hmm. One of the things that is really nice about Visual Studio is it auto completes a lot of the stuff as it starts to know, detect where you're actually going to type. And it makes typing this stuff out so much faster. So I know. I'm going to, I'm going to get it. It's just that it's asking me a bunch of other stuff. So I was like, I just, I want to pay attention. So <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Great. Okay. Have you uh, typed this one out? Debug.log hello world? Yeah. And have you seen it working? You can hit run on your game. And then when you hit space, you should see it print hello world into your console. Oh. Yes. 
Natalie has finished her first C sharp Unity script. Well, not finished, but kind of finished. It does something. <laughs> we'll take it. So we can see too that every time I hit this, it is, even if I'm up here and it's not showing me new lines, we can see that my number of comments is still increasing. So it's actually still printing a line every time I hit it. You got that working, Catherine? No, sorry. Damn. So what's not working? <laughs> you know what it is? I'm trying to figure out how I did it last time to refresh the, the, um, the script. Uh, oh, that's really weird that you have to do that. It should just be that you save the script and then Unity automatically detects that something has changed. Mm -mm, it won't. It doesn't do it. But oh, I found it. <laughs> OK. So where is it actually for me to know this for the future? So when I click on the script um, mm -hmm. in the inspector, mm -hmm. uh, where it says imported object, then there's like three little lines. Uh, oh, um, over on the inspector side. Oh, OK. There's a three little lines and uh, right there. And it says reset. reset huh. And it like refreshes the code. That is such a pain. <laughs> I know. I well, don't know hopefully, why. Yeah, hopefully you can get Visual Studio working after the class when you don't have yeah. to do that anymore. Yeah. OK. So uh, let us know if that works. All right, yeah, I'm going to do that now. Yeah. So then I just hit play? Yeah, you should just be able to hit play. And as long as you have everything hooked up in the inspector, you should be able to hit space. And in the console, it'll say, hello world. All right. OK, I got it. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Celebrate! <laughs> OK, so it printing hello world is, is wonderful, fantastic. But this is a video game. We want Mario to actually jump. Now, we have my jumper already hooked up. And if we look at the jumper script, we can see that the function that would actually make him jump is just called jump. So whenever we want to activate a function, whenever we want it to actually happen, I showed you guys how to do that already. You actually just type the name followed by parentheses and a semicolon. So if I had, you do not need to type this. I'm just going to do this as an example. If I had an example function and it like did some stuff, do some stuff. And I want to do that stuff in my update whenever I hit the button. I literally type example function. And Unity now knows that I want to call or execute this function during this moment. So this is when I create the function and tell it how it should exist and what it should do whenever it gets called or executed. And this is how I actually call or execute it. So this will now actually do some stuff. If this were not here, no stuff shall be done. So if that's the case, what do we have to type here to make Mario jump? My jumper. My jumper. Dot jump. Dot jump. Look at that. You skipped a step. I assumed you guys would type would tell me to type jump. But remember that the function jump is not inside of the player controller. It is instead inside of the jumper. So my copy of the jumper is currently named my jumper, right? That's the copy that's attached to Mario. So if we want to use that thing to do anything that it knows how to do, in this case, literally only jump, I can just say my jumper dot whatever function we want to call. In this case, jump. So my jumper dot jump. And now if I hit run and I hit space, once it finishes loading and everything, Oops. Mario will now jump. <laughs> wow. OK. So everybody should go ahead and get your jumper working. While you are doing that, I'm going to talk about the input here. So the input is what's called a static class, which just means we can access it without a reference variable. 
And whenever we do that, we have to use the uppercase because we're talking to the class itself. So the input class is something that Unity already built for us and that just exists. And then you can see we're doing the same stuff we just learned how to do. We're just asking for a specific function from the input. In this case, the function that we're asking for is get key down, which just returns true or false if a certain key is pressed. We have to tell it what key we want to listen for. So we're going to use another static class called key code that Unity has available to us that has a variable in it called space. This is just the key code to tell the input that the space is the key we're actually listening for. So what this winds up effectively doing is just is space pressed with an if statement, a conditional. So if space is pressed, then we're going to go in here. If space is not pressed, then we're not going to go in there. And that's it. OK. So let's, now that we have all these newfound amazing powers, let's grab ourselves a mover. The mover is the thing that actually knows how to move Mario left and right. So at the top of the class, line seven, I want you to add a new line and do the same thing we did before. So we're going to make a public mover, my mover. A public mover, my mover on a new separate line. I think we actually don't need the start method for this class but we'll leave it for now. Public mover, my mover. Now the mover is a little bit more complicated than the jumper. If we open up the mover for ourselves, we'll see uh, a bunch of stuff in here. Um, but even though this is a little bit scary and intimidating for us, we can see that if we scroll down, it has one main function, just like the jumper. In this case, it has a function called accelerate in direction. The mover knows how to move the character towards a direction. And all we have to do is tell it which direction to actually move. So functions, you'll notice this get key down function takes in what's called a parameter or a value to change how the function actually operates. You do not need to type this. I'm going to do this as an example. If I made a public example function again, and this example function says int number one and int number two. And then this thing says return number one plus number two. First of all, what does this function actually do? Here, I'll do it here. This will make it a little bit clearer. So if you just had to guess, what do you think example int is going to equal? <laughs> uh, three or five? I don't. Um, Natalie, yeah. not quite. <laughs> Natalie? Uh, it returns a value that's the sum of the first and second argument, or number one and number two. Correct, which makes it? Eight. Eight. So this is actually adding. And we can see that. We know that that's true because we're looking at the opening and closing brackets. We know that everything inside of those opening and closing brackets, even if there were a million of these, whoops, I just broke my stuff. Oh gosh, hold on, hold on. Even if there were a million lines, it's going to run through every line, right? Just every line, line by line is going to happen whenever I call or execute this function. In this case, there's only one line and all it does is adds number one plus number two. So our three plus five is going to happen. Example int is going to be eight. This right here, when I declare my function, is how I say, hey, whenever this function gets called, I'm going to need some information. And in this case, the information I need is two integers, one integer called number one and one integer called number two. And then we're going to add those two numbers together. So that is how get key down knows which key we're actually pressing because we're telling it that. So in the future, when we want to listen for left input for the left key, somebody tell me what I'm going to do. Somebody tell me what I'm going to write in this if statement. Input. Okay. Input. 
dot get key down. Dot get key down. Open parentheses. Yep. Key code. Key code. Dot. Well, do we want to use A? Uh, or I, I'll help you out here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll help you out here. So I could do dot A if I wanted to use WASD. I can also do left arrow is literally the left arrow key. And then I use my opening and closing brackets. So this now is a block of uh, script that will allow me to listen for when I hit the left key. Now, uh, because we're running out of time, I'm going to jump forward here. Normally, when uh, people write script and they make a mistake, I let the mistake happen so that we can see how to fix it in the future. But we only have about 45 minutes, and I want to get you guys to a playable state with the game. So one thing to point out here is this term, get key down. It's um, something that you'll become more used to as you program in engineering more. But get key down is actually only going to happen once when we press the key. So I'm going to press the key down, and Mario's going to jump one time. He's not going to keep jumping. What does that mean for moving, though? It's only going to activate one time. Yeah, he can kind of go like this, right? He's not going to go far enough. So what we actually want is a different version of the same function called just get key. Get key means just, is it currently pressed? So because I'm holding the left key, he'll now keep moving to the left because it's just it's continually checking if it is currently pressed. Get key down only checks, it was it just pressed? All right. So this is where we're going to use our mover from the my mover that we added earlier. We're going to say my mover dot. Remember the name of that function that we looked up in the mover? And if you don't, why don't you check your mover script? What is the name of the function that we're going to use from the mover? Accelerate in direction. Yes. Accelerate in direction. Spell that right? Looks like it. Nope. <laughs> oh, good. I did. All right. So uh, I'm then going to need, remember, this is a function. So it needs its parentheses and its semicolon. Uh, hmm, crap. But it's still underlined in red. Now, this is uh, only true in Visual Studio. So unfortunately, right now for you, Catherine, this is probably not happening. But if I uh, hover over this, it will tell me why it's red, what's wrong. And it says, there is no argument given that corresponds to the required formal parameter direction of mover.accelerate in direction. Now, I know that sounds like a little bit of jargon, but the one term to pull out of that is a parameter. Do we remember what a parameter actually is? from our example. Basically the input. The input, which what is the input here for our accelerate in direction? A vector two. A vector two called direction is a direction. Accelerate in direction needs to know which direction to actually accelerate. So the reason that it's red right now is because it doesn't know what direction to accelerate. And it's like, what do you, what do you want me to do? So we have to actually give it what's called a vector two which is an indication of direction. A vector is essentially an arrow in space pointing in a direction. And with a vector two, we can declare an x and a y. So if I wanted to have a 45 degree, I would have an x and a y of one. And that would wind up with, you can imagine kind of like if I'm looking at a graph, that would wind up with a point at one, one. And then from zero to one, that winds up with that 45 degree angle I'm talking about. So if we want to just move it to the left, we're going to need what? a positive, uh, excuse me, a negative x pointing backwards and no y at all, because I just want to move to the left. So this is going to be a little bit unfamiliar to you. But if you want to make a more complex variable, this is not true for all kinds of variables. It's, it's sort of like learning the English language, right? There's all kinds of exceptions to the rules. But for simple variables, often all you have to do is just say the name like this, public jumper. For more complicated variables, you sometimes are going to have to use this new keyword. And you'll learn that mostly on a case-by-case -case basis. So for a vector 2, I have to say new vector 2. And then I can actually tell it what my x and my y are. In this case, I'll save you guys some time. Our x and our y is going to be negative 1 and 0, because we're going to point towards the left, which is negative. And then not at all up and down, because we just want Mario to move left and right. OK? 
So this is hopefully where things are starting to click a little bit and where a big complicated line when broken down into pieces makes a little bit more sense. We're talking to my mover, a mover object that's attached to Mario. That mover object is using a function called accelerate indirection, which takes in one parameter, a vector two, which indicates the direction we want to move. And when we want to make a vector two, we have to say new and then declare the actual vector. Okay. So this should actually move Mario to the left. So let's pop into our game. And I want to hit play and see what happens. If I drop Mario now and I hit left, oh, sweet Lord. I'm having, looks like hundreds of crashes a second. That thing on the right is red and it's, uh, that means it is a crash. So if I was running this on somebody's phone, the game would have literally broken. Anybody guess what's happening? I'll give you a virtual cookie if you do. <laughs> Why is this currently crashing? <laughs> um, I don't remember, but did... sorry. No, you can do it. Uh, did we associate the mover with the player controller? Nailed it! Yes. So even though this is kind of scary and you're getting hundreds of crashes a second and that's kind of overwhelming, this is actually one of the easiest crashes you're ever going to run into. If you ever see the term null reference exception, 99% of the time, that means you just forgot to hook something up in the inspector. So it's crashing because currently the player controller is saying, hey, mover, I want you to go to the left, but the mover doesn't exist. And remember that computers are totally literal, so it can't like guess what you're talking about. It's just like, oh, I'm broken. So on our player, all we have to do here, and make sure your game is not running. So the main reason to uh, uh, the main reason to do the color thing that I pointed out, if your game is running and you make changes in the inspector, they will not always be saved. That is on purpose so that you can experiment with your game while it's running and then hit play and you know that none of your changes are gonna be saved. It's, it's on purpose, but it's also a common gotcha that you'll change something like assigning the mover and then stop playing the game and then it won't be there anymore and you'll be like, what happened? So make sure your game is not running when you want to make changes in your inspector. So we now have our mover, we can see it is none, which is why we're having crashes. All we have to do is drag and drop our mover into that empty box and then hit play. And if I hit left, Mario will fly off into the sunset in a beautiful little spin. <laughs> wow. All right. So I'd like everybody to get to the point where Mario uh, flies off, and then I will keep talking. I'm just going to keep having him fly off until you guys do that. Jump. Oh, yeah, we made space jump. Space. Wow. And I can leave this script up too if anyone needs that. Okay. Uh, can I get a thumbs up if you have Mario flying off into the sunset? OK. Catherine, do we have a flying Mario yet? No, not yet. I'm trying to figure Dang. out what I did wrong. <laughs> so what's, what's currently happening? Uh, I have to get the mover option on my script. But... Oh, is it the weird resetting thing again? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll let you know if I got it. <laughs> OK. <laughs> So uh, I am, what shall we do next while we wait? Let me pull that up for a moment. OK, so we are going to, um, we're at 823. Let's, yeah, let's go ahead and add the uh, right movement as well, which is hopefully something that you guys can do fairly easily now. So in your update, uh, and Catherine, why don't you watch this part for a second, not to interrupt you, but I just want to make sure this is clear. So uh, my if statement here that accelerates us towards the left can be repurposed to also accelerate us towards the right. 
Anybody know what I'm going to do in my script to do that? Maybe instead of negative one, do just one? Heck yeah, you're totally right. So if I delete that, that'll move us to the right. We'd also need to change the arrow, right? But oh, right. if I did that, then can I move to the left now? No. No. So I can just copy and paste this if statement. That's all I was looking for. So if I uh, take this entire chunk right here, I copy and I go down and I hit paste. And I now have two if statements and I can change this to keycode.write arrow. And you are totally right. Just delete that negative one and make it a positive one. Oh, we have chats. Oh, it's all Natalie. Natalie is saying lots of things and it's all wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. Uh, okay. So we now should have a Mario that can move to the left and the right. If I hit play here, we can see that Mario will in fact take a second to load and then he can roll himself to the left and right and he can jump. Now there's a bit of a problem here. I've never played a version of Mario where he can freaking roll. Um, so there's a very simple way to stop him from doing this. Uh, the reason, actually, can anyone tell me why this is happening? It is because of our collider. He can rotate. Yeah, he can rotate. And the bottom of a capsule collider is round. Um, so he literally has something to rotate along. Now, that's a really common thing with capsule colliders. Capsule colliders are great for, once again, sort of approximating the shape of a human body um, and doing it very cheaply but they allow rotation. So a way to counteract that, if you click on Mario, you click on rigid body 2D, mine was uh, closed up. Remember that these little arrows are drop downs. If you come down to the, about the middle of your rigid body 2D uh, or, or towards the bottom, depending on what you have open, there's a constraints drop down. If you drop down your constraints drop down, you can freeze position and rotation using a rigid body. So I just want you to hit freeze rotation Z. And that will stop Mario from being able to rotate this way so that he slides himself along the ground in a way that makes more sense to us. And now he can actually jump and we can freaking play Mario. Wow. Okay, awesome. All right, Catherine, where are you? Where are we at? Oh. <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> okay, so here, it's here's what I want you to do for now. Um, are we going to do more to this? I think we're not going to do more to this. So uh, just to point out to everybody, you have a completed player controller script. The completed player controller has two additional uh, functionalities that we didn't write ourselves. The first one is that it tells the sprite render to flip its X. So if I look at Mario, under his sprite render, he actually has a flip button for both the X and the Y. And if I flip his X, he looks the other way. So the more complicated completed player controller will actually have him turn the direction that he's facing instead of just sort of moonwalking. So that's something that you guys can add after this class. The other thing that it does is it plays a sound whenever he jumps. Uh, we will we'll go ahead and get to music today. I'm going to make sure that we get to that so that you have an understanding of how audio sources work. But besides the fact that we haven't actually seen an audio source, we will see that it works exactly the same way. First, it says, hey, does this audio source exist? Null is just, does it exist? So as long as this audio source exists, then we want that thing to use a function, which in this case is play, which just plays the sound that the audio source has. So that's how we can make something play a jump sound. So what I'd like you to do for now, Catherine, I know this is a bit disappointing, but you can always come back to it. Why don't you go ahead and remove the uh, player controller that you wrote from Mario? You can remove components by right next to that, to the name itself. So like player controller script, the three dots. If you click that and just hit remove component, that will remove the player controller. And then you can add the completed player controller and then make sure you hook up your jumper, your mover and your sprite renderer and Mario will just start working. You don't need to hook up the audio source. OK, let me it. try that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So we'll have you do that just so that you can follow along with the class. And then you can totally write the scripts yourself. Uh, all of the other scripts for the rest of today, since we're coming close to the end of class, we are going to just use my completed scripts. 
But as I said, I tried my best to make it so that all of the scripts have enough explanation so that hopefully you can understand how they work and start to learn a little bit more about Unity and game development. So we are going to next make, yeah, let's make a coin. So a coin is going to be real, real easy for you. All I want you to do is drag and drop that coin image from the assets that I grabbed you into Unity itself. I'm going to go ahead and grab the piranha plant and the flag as well, all the images from my asset pack. So now I have a piranha plant, Mario, a flag, a coin, a brick. And I can drag and drop that coin into the world. It's definitely a little bit big, so I can make that coin a bit smaller. And I can put that coin somewhere that I want to collect it. So just give yourself a coin somewhere in your scene. OK, on that coin, I want you to add a collider. In this case, probably either a box collider or a circle collider is going to be your best bet. With colliders, uh, it doesn't make a huge difference. Just remember that this is what actually collides. So it's oftentimes just you trying to guess what's going to fit, uh, fit the shape be best. Ooh, having trouble talking. What's going to fit the shape best. Uh, in this case, actually, a capsule collider is probably our best bet because the coin is kind of oblong. So I'm going to add a capsule collider to this coin. Um, and we can see that the green here is too big for the coin. If you'd like, you can go ahead and mess with some of your settings, try to get it to be the exact proportions. But uh, remember that it's not strictly necessary. It's just going to change how your game actually functions. OK. Once you have a coin image with a collider on it, I want you to add component and add the completed coin script. If we had really breezed through today, and don't worry, like inevitably every class that I do like this, there's stuff that we don't get to. I, I make it that way deliberately, just so that in case we breeze through everything, we still have stuff to cover. Um, so the completed coin we were potentially going to write, I will go ahead and go over it a little bit. But just adding a collider and the completed coin to your script is going to almost make this thing work. The other thing that you have to do here with your coin and your flag is actually hit is trigger. So Kevin already discovered this for us. But our coin in Mario, we don't want Mario to collect a coin and then go like this, right? We don't want him to face plant every time he tries to pick up a coin. In Mario, he just goes straight through the coin and picks it up and it's no problem. So this is a perfect example of where we might use the trigger. The flag is actually the same way. With a flag, we don't want Mario to run into the flag and not be able to go by. We want him to land on the flag and do his cute little animation, which in this case, we're not going to do because that's a little bit more complicated than, than this class. But we can at least make it a trigger so that he's allowed to pass through the flag and continue on to the next level. So both our flag and our coin will only work if we add a collider and then select is trigger. We then will also need to add component completed coin and completed flag to the flag. So now if I hit play and I move Mario over to this coin, the coin will automatically disappear. And we can see in our console, it'll say coin collected. Nice, we picked up a coin. So that's the first thing you can add to your world. Uh, so I'm going to pause here. Are Natalie and Kevin, do you guys have a coin? Yes. Nice. Good job, Kevin. And Catherine, where are you at, at this point? Yes, I got the coin. <laughs> yes. Do you have a moving Mario? <laughs> oh, I haven't played. Hold on. Oh, OK. <laughs> Let me see. Hold on. <laughs> I have the coin set. <laughs> oh, yes. Moving Mario. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. Oh, good. OK. I kind of miss him rolling, though. <laughs> uh, well, you can always deactivate that if you want. <laughs> Why not? It's your game. <laughs> uh, OK. So we now have a coin object in our scene. Let's go ahead and uh, add the flag as well. And then we're going to talk about UI a little bit. So I've got my coin. I can grab that flag image and also put that in our world. Once again, it's quite big, so I can shrink that down a little bit. Uh, and place it somewhere for Mario to win at. Now, if I uh, put it right here, we'll see that this happens sometimes with images that the size of the image itself is a lot bigger than the flag. So when I hit Add Component, and in this case, I'm probably going to do a box collider, 
the box collider is going to be way too big. So this is an example where probably I'm going to mess with the collider a little bit here in my editor uh, to try to make it a little more appropriate to the actual size of the flag. Maybe like uh, looks like a two works for me. Uh, and once again, just like the coin, this needs to be a trigger to work. If it is a collider, it will not work. So if you're working on this later and you're like, why is my flag doing nothing? It's probably because you didn't hit is trigger. You can then add component completed flag. And when you hit play, you can now go touch uh, crap. I can't see anything. Oh, I managed to touch it. <laughs> uh, so we'll see that our world is only so big currently, right? It is only as big as the camera can actually fit. And then Mario goes off the screen. And once again, our game is what the player is actually going to see, right? So the player is going to see Mario disappearing into nothingness. Uh, I have a script for you to fix this. It is called a follower. The follower can be put on any object and will make it snap to another object in the scene. So we're going to put it on our camera so that the camera snaps to the player and stays stuck to him so that when he moves, the camera is looking at whatever the player sees. So on our main camera, I'm going to hit add component follower. And we'll see that the follower is asking for a followed transform. This is the thing that it will actually follow. So in this case, what should it be? Mario. Mario, yeah. So I'm going to drag and drop Mario into that followed transform spot. And then when I hit play, we'll see that the camera snaps to Mario's position and now follows him as he goes. So I can now make my level as big as I want, and the game will still work. When I touch that flag, we can see in my console, it says game one. Congratulations. <laughs> OK. So we have a functional flag and a functional coin and a Mario with a camera. Is anybody having issues with any of those? Is that all working for you? Great. So what you're, you're experiencing a little bit of sort of both worlds here. I want to impress upon you that the coding that we just did really is a massive part of game development, period, no matter what you do, pretty much. Um, that is a, you can look at it as an unfortunate reality. It also, though, is sort of unlimited power because you're really, you're getting into the, the heart of the computer and telling it exactly how you want it to operate. I've made a bunch of scripts, a bunch of components for you. We're going to keep using a couple of them. Don't worry, we're not, we're not done quite yet. Um, so that you can just drag and drop them and add them to stuff and play around in your world. Um, but when you really want to start making your own games, script is absolutely a huge part of it. I tried to give you enough of an example so that you can start to understand what's here, what's in the other existing script that I wrote for you, and hopefully just play around with them. That's the big thing that I recommend. So for instance, if I opened up the uh, completed uh, coin, let's say, we can see that we have the coin collected text here. So if I wanted this to say something else, I could have say like, I don't know, pick up coin. And as long as I save that and hit play and wait for Unity to load and then hit play, when I jump up and touch that coin, it's now going to say picked up coin instead of coin collected. So what I recommend after this class, I have in our handout, uh, is it over here? Yes. In our handout, we can see that everything we covered today is broken down piece by piece. And there are some challenges for you to try to do after the fact. Um, what I recommend is that you keep playing around with these scripts. You mess around with some of these variables, see what happens when you do X and Y, and just uh, learn the Unity engine that way. The more you play with it, the more it's going to make sense. Don't get frustrated, just have fun. OK. So we have a Mario who can walk around and touch a flag. That's wonderful. But the flag right now is not very exciting. It just says you won and then kind of does nothing else. So let's also touch upon Unity UI. So UI is slightly different from sprites in that it is an image that is affixed to the camera. What is an example of UI in a game? A title screen. Yeah, a title screen is a great one. Um, but what about like Legend of Zelda when I'm actually playing Zelda? When I'm like hacking goblins and stuff. Oh, like stats. 
yeah, like the hearts and maybe an indication of the things that you have of your inventory, maybe in the top right, right? That kind of thing. That's actually UI. That's stuff that hovers around on top of the camera. The main difference, the way for you to differentiate them is these are sprites. They are things that exist in the world. The reason we call them sprites, another fun fact for you, is actually because they used to be an entirely separate piece of memory. They used to be an entirely separate thing that the computer thought of and then put on top of the image that it is rendering for you. So they were an entirely separate thing you could move around. So in many old school video games, Pac-Man, et cetera, Pac-Man himself was a sprite and was actually drawn entirely separately from the entire maze. So that was a whole separate like revolutionary thing back in the time. These days, basically just any 2D object that exists in our scene, we consider a sprite. And then a 2D object that exists on the camera, like Link's hearts or some inventory or whatever, or the menu for that matter, is considered UI. Because no matter where I look, that UI is coming with us. So let's add one piece of UI. I want you to go up and hit plus in the top left of the hierarchy, go down to UI, and drop in a panel. And we'll see that like now I have this gigantic freaking panel. It's so big I have to scroll out like super far. This is just a quirk of Unity and I'm not exactly sure why they do it. A very, impor uh, very important hot tip for you is if you double click on anything in the hierarchy, it will automatically zoom you to that thing, including the panel itself. So this is super useful when you start to get lost. For whatever reason, UI elements, they uh, make super huge. I think it's supposed to be sort of you're looking at it in two spaces. My game is over here, nice and small, and I can zoom in on it. And then the UI is out here, big and like easy to see. But we can see that uh, even though it's humongous, it's actually rendered one to one on the screen itself. So if I make this thing half of this massive space, it's half of the screen. So this UI is actually uh, still the same size as everything in your game. Just for whatever reason, they make it humongous to try to sort of make it a separate object. OK. So yeah, I want you to zoom out to your panel. This is going to be your wind screen. So I want you to rename this wind screen. And now we're going to talk about object. Uh, it's not inheritance, the object hierarchy. I think there's a different name for it, but that's what we're going to call it for now. Basically, parent and child objects in your hierarchy. You'll notice that you didn't just made a panel. You made two other things. What other things did you make? And this in the event system. Yep. So in Unity, everything that is UI exists inside of a canvas. The main reason they do this is so that you can mess with placement of stuff and also the anchoring of stuff. So Link's hearts would be anchored to the top of the screen, right? And no matter how the screen size changes, they're always going to be on the top of the screen. Uh, so basically, the canvas exists as a wrapper for all of your UI in order to better handle changing screen sizes. As you start to get more advanced in the world of game development, you will realize that different screen sizes and different screen resolutions are the bane of your existence, and you will hate them and canvases are one of the ways to make them better. Now, the other thing you'll notice is that your canvas has the windscreen inside of it, underneath it. So this is what we call a parent-child relationship in the hierarchy. The windscreen is a child of the canvas. And if I move the canvas, which I actually can't do because it's a canvas, the child will move with it. So let's actually see an example of that happening. What I want you to do is right click on the windscreen and you'll see that there's the exact same set of options as that plus button. So I want you to right click on the windscreen, go down to UI and click text. And you'll see a text object gets created. And not only does a text object get created, but it's also underneath our windscreen, just like the windscreen is underneath the canvas. So we actually now have a parent child child relationship where the uh, text is a child of the windscreen, is a child of the canvas. And now you'll really see what I'm talking about. If I move my windscreen, the text comes with me. So this is how you get objects to be paired together and move all together like a group. So now you can do whatever you want to that text. I'm just going to say, you won. And uh, by the way, if you start changing text size and you notice that your text disappears, so you can see I make my text size 80 and now it's gone. 
That's because the almost always that's because the text object itself is just not big enough to display text that big. So probably you're going to have to stretch this out until it is big enough. Okay. Now, uh, just like any other component, there's lots of settings here available for you to mess with. So I'm going to actually change the alignment of my paragraph to be center middle. Now my text is directly in the middle. Okay. Now for the interest of time, I'm going to have you leave your windscreen in this state, and then you can come back and play with it and make it awesome later. What I want you to do is set your windscreen to active false. This is a little bit weird, but basically every game object in Unity has the ability to turn off. And when you turn it off, it still exists. You have not deleted it, but it cannot be seen or interacted with. And it is very useful for this exact kind of scenario. So when you have your windscreen selected and it's up in your inspector, in the very top left, right next to its name, you'll see a checkbox. If you check that box, it's gone. Magic. So we've now hidden the windscreen essentially with the ability to bring it back whenever we want to show it. So this is how you can make things like this, a menu that pops up when you hit the pause button or whatever. Now, uh, I actually already have something built in to pull up that windscreen for us. So if you double click on your flag to zoom in and look at your completed flag script, your completed flag component on the flag, you'll see that the windscreen there is an empty box. So you can imagine what you do, drag and drop your windscreen from the hierarchy into that empty box. And now when you hit play, if I walk over and touch that flag, I'll get a nice U1 text. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to uh, have us do, uh, actually, let's, I'm going to make sure everybody gets to this point. To the point where we can touch the flag and get a nice piece of text. All right. Thumbs up if you have a flag you can touch. It shows a thing. Catherine, where are we at? Do I have to move the wind? Do I have to move it to the, the flag, the, the windscreen? You don't need to move it there. You can, uh, so you have to drag and drop it to that empty box. So if you click on your flag, uh, mm -hmm. the flag has the completed flag script on it, right? Yes. Uh, flag. Google. And it has an empty box that says windscreen. Yeah. Currently, does it currently say none? No, it has it has the wind wind. Screen. Oh, okay. That should be all you have to do. Mm, let me see. If you're touching the flag and it's not popping up, it might be that you did something weird to your um, windscreen. Right, Maybe it's see. like off the side of the canvas. Like if I put this over here, we can see. I can't see it. Something like that. <laughs> Did you get it? No, but uh, Mario fell off the block and he just kept going down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I'm going to, uh, let's do this. Catherine, I'm going to wrap the class and then I can hang back for a minute or two to make sure this is working for you so that you have okay. it functional. All and right. then uh, we'll close it up. So the okay. last thing, <laughs> I'm glad that it's making you laugh. That's good. That's how you're going to learn. Um, so the last thing that I want to show you is audio. Uh, in your game, I want you to do one thing for me. I want you to hit at the very top of the hierarchy your plus button and create empty. So when you hit create empty, you make a game object just like anything else, but you'll see that the only component that is attached to it is the transform. This thing only has a space, has a point in space where it exists. Otherwise, it doesn't know about anything else. Uh, this is often what I'll do if I want something to do something, but not have you know a physical body, not actually be able to be seen by the player or something. And in this case, I'm going to make this thing called the music player. 
this is actually going to be the thing that plays music for us. Uh, so I'm going to hit uh, add component on my music player and go to audio source and add an audio source to this music player. So an audio source is our very common game object that plays sound. That is all it does. You'll see that it has an audio clip with an empty slot. And that is actually waiting to accept an MP3 or a wave or any other type of audio. I've included some Mario music for you. So you can grab that from our asset pack. I also included a jump sound, which it has a little bit about in your challenges for you to try to add into your game. But for now, I'm going to grab my Mario theme and drag and drop that into Unity. And once I have it in Unity, I can drag and drop that onto that empty slot, that audio clip slot in my music player. Now, besides turning on loop, which you might want to do just so that the music keeps looping even after it ends, you can just hit play now and have music in your game. I will warn you, it's a very loud MP3. You guys can hear because I didn't turn it on, but it's great. <laughs> All right, so uh, if you can all pay attention here for the last couple of minutes, I'm going to go over a couple of things for you to come back and review in this video for me to point out the parts that we didn't actually add to the game. Um, so this is just like a bit for you to come back to and look at later when you're trying to figure things out. Okay, so the main thing that we didn't get to is the plant, is the enemy. So first, all you're going to have to do is the same thing you've done before. You're going to add a image with a, you're going to add a uh, empty object with a sprite render and attach that piranha plant as the actual image. That's easy, we've done that. It is also going to need a collider, not a trigger. So add a collider to it, do not hit the button for trigger. Once you've done that, you are going to add a destructor to this piranha plant. The destructor knows how to destruct things, knows how to do damage. Uh, this is an example of a script that has parity, a script that has a partner. In this case, its partner is a destructible. Anything that has a destructible attached to it knows how to be destroyed by a destructor. So we're going to add the destructor to our plant and then add the destructible to what? To Mario. To Mario, yeah. And then we're going to uh, set some parameters. So the destructible, for instance, uh, we might want to set his health to one because that's like normally how Mario works. If I touch anything, I die. So that is the destructor and destructible for you to try to add later. Now, there are a couple of other things in here. Uh, I think we've covered pretty much everything. Yep, yep. Uh, the only other things that are in here are your challenges. Now, the easy challenge is to make another level. So in Unity, we're currently working in a scene, right? Scenes are basically like levels. So if I come down to my sample scene here, and I uh, right click, unfortunately, you can't right click and hit duplicate, but you can hit Command D to duplicate something, or you can copy and paste. So if I copy and paste this scene, can I really not? Look at that, I can't even do that. I don't know why this is a thing. So if I right click on a scene, I can't hit duplicate, but I can still do Command D or Control D to duplicate it. And apparently, I can't even copy and paste. So I don't know why they don't just make that a nice and easy option for you. But you can definitely select your scene and hit Command D on Mac or Control D on PC to actually duplicate it and then have another scene. When I double click on this scene, we will open the scene. Now, because we duplicated it, it looks exactly the same. But we'll notice in our hierarchy, it says sample scene one. And if I delete a bunch of stuff and then hit Command Save, you have to save your scenes. And then I switch back to sample scene, we'll see they're actually two separate scenes, kind of like two separate levels. So your easy homework, exactly like two separate levels. Your easy homework is to make yourself a whole new level. Add a bunch of stuff, whatever you want to do, add a couple of levels in your game. Your medium homework is to add some sound effects. 
So you have an example of this working in your jumper. Your jumper actually tries to find, oh, the jumper, duh. oh yeah, we do that in our player controller. The player controller has a slot, if you look at the completed player controller for an audio source. So you can attach an audio source to Mario and put the jump sound in that audio source and then have it play whenever you hit jump. So try to just do that, but then try to add it to like the coin or the flag or something like that. Try to add some more sound effects to your game. And your hardest homework, this is where you're gonna really have to code, and this is where it may be uh, tricky, is to add a score mechanism. So this is going to involve writing a whole new script and then having this coin tell that script that it got picked up so that it can add to a, a permanent score. So this is gonna be your example code for that. Uh, now, the other thing that I recommend outside of working on this game and continuing to play around with it, which is really like, that's how you're gonna learn. Just keep playing with it, keep experimenting, keep working on things that sound fun, is to do game jams. Now, depending on your skill level, game jams may be a little bit beyond you, but you could get ready to do a game jam in just a month or two, pretty easy. Has anybody heard of what a game jam is? Yeah, I've heard of it before. What's a game jam? Like you collaborate together with other people to create a game. Yep. Yeah. So you can collaborate. You can also do them on your own if you're uncomfortable collaborating. Although you can definitely make much cooler stuff with a team than you can make it by yourself. Um, usually a game jam just means you're going to make something in a set period of time. So you have a weekend to make a whole game. Or you have a week sometimes to make a whole game. Ludum Dare is top dog in the industry. Everybody loves doing Ludum Dare. And then itch.io just has an insane number of game jams at any moment. So you can join some and try to build a game in a weekend or in a week or whatever they're actually advertising. Uh, and finally, come join our community. Obviously, I am uh, not just uh, some weirdo here talking to you. We are from the Indie Game Academy. So the Indie Game Academy is a group of people uh, that we put together actually pretty recently. This is only a couple of months old. Uh, we run a program that we call the Video Game Accelerator where basically we run Hogwarts for gamers. <laughs> so you and a multi, uh, multidisciplinary group of people actually get put into a team and build a game together over three months. You ideate, complete, create, and publish and monetize a game together in just three months. So not only will you be a published game developer in three months, you'll be a monetized game developer, potentially making money from your game in three months. The whole point is that we are trying to teach you how to run an indie studio. And what I often say to my students is if you leave this program and feel like just maybe you can start your own indie game company, then I have succeeded. It is, I think for many of you, it may be too advanced at this time, but because it's multidisciplinary, if you have other skills that you think you could lend to a game team, such as doing marketing or uh, art or music or whatever the heck, it could still be open to you. So what I'm gonna do, is first of all, definitely stick my Discord link. Do I have a thing? I do have a thing. I'll stick the Discord link here into the chat window. So this is now available to you because you have taken the class with us. I don't let anybody in, but I do let people in who take any kind of course with me as long as I think you're cool. So you guys are now welcome to come join the Discord. We're a bunch of goofs. We call ourselves the Wizards of Joy, so you know that we're fun. Uh, so all kinds of support there, all kinds of community, uh, definitely just come and join totally free. If you have any problems with this course, for instance, with trying to keep working on this game after today, uh, we'll be there to help you out. In addition, if you want to hear about future courses, we try to do one of these every month. So if you want to hear about future courses, this is our email sign up if that's interesting to you. And then finally, if you are interested in learning about the, um, let me grab the link. If you're interested in learning about the Indie Game Accelerator, which starts on April 26th, so if you're even a little bit interested, definitely reach out to talk to us uh, about the program. Here is the website for you to learn more about it. All of these things are also in your document handout. Okay, so that is everything that I have for you. That's my whole spiel. Before I say goodbye, does anybody have any questions or anything for me? And Catherine and anybody else can definitely stay if we have anything to fix. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, of course. <laughs> yeah, this was fun. I love your enthusiasm for teaching. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I started doing this just Unity boot camps for somebody else, teaching somebody else's program in Unity. 
And I love that stuff. That's, that's great too. But what I had the most fun with was the last two weeks when people got to build whatever they wanted to build and just seeing the like intense creative power of somebody who's just learned to build a video game is what got me super pumped and is why I started IGA, the Indie Game Academy, um, and why I do classes like this and why I do the much bigger, that, that course is my baby, a three month program where, uh, I mean, as I said, you basically go to Hogwarts, you get sorted into a freaking house. You are either house rogue, house cleric, house warrior, or house ranger. We'll see which one you are. Uh, and they all compete for the house cup. Last cohort, uh, house ranger stole the house cup. So we'll see who, who steals it, who wins it this time. Um, yeah, definitely. I am happy to have you here. Thank you all of you for being sweet and good. This was honestly one of the easiest ones I have had. There have been ones when I'm like mutant people. I don't think I've ever had to kick anyone before, but it definitely gets a lot stressful, a lot more stressful than it was tonight. So thank you for being good students. <laughs> okay. So uh, yeah, I'm going to say goodbye. Anyone who wants to take off can. Anyone who wants to fix any problems they got can definitely chill. I encourage you to come join our Discord. I encourage you to join our email list, and I definitely encourage you to apply to the Indie Game Academy. I freaking love that program. <laughs> okay. All right. So, Catherine, do you have anything you want to try to fix? Yeah, I'm going to uh, just hop on my this computer real quick with uh, on the Zoom so I can share my screen. Perfect. I am going to eat a pretzel. Okay, no worries. <laughs> Anybody else have stuff they want to they fix? What about the uh, the infinite jumping? Oh, because you can jump forever. Yeah. Wow, actually, OK, well, I'm still recording. This is great. Anyone who had infinite jumping, I forgot about a component that I wrote for you called the ground detector. <laughs> so on your player right now, he doesn't know when he's touching the ground, so he's allowed to jump no matter what. If on your player you add the ground detector script, which I included for you, he should only jump when he's uh, not touching the ground, when he is touching the ground, excuse me. Let me actually confirm that that works. I'm hearing somebody play. <laughs> um, uh, let me, I totally forgot about that one. Thank you, Kevin. Let me see if that works, because I'm actually surprised at the, yeah, OK. That does work. And let me know if that works for you guys too. Um, I'm me. surprised the jumper works without it. But yeah, you can add the ground detector so that you don't have a flying Mario. Or you can leave a flying Mario because maybe that's a fun game too. <laughs> Any other questions? Anything to work on? You know what? I can't join on this laptop. <laughs> no. So what's uh, what's? can you describe what's actually happening? What's wrong right now? Well, the um, when I touch the flag, nothing comes. the The windscreen doesn't come up. Mm -hmm. um, and okay. then, yeah. let's start with that. Don't okay. even tell me about the other thing. All right. Okay. So there's a couple <laughs> things to check. Um, this is always this is sort of how debugging goes. We just sort of piecemeal like work through all the things it could be, right? <clears throat> so first thing is, they are definitely hooked up, right? The flag knows about the windscreen. Oh, let's see. Hold on. I think I did that. Uh, flag. Yeah, the I did the completed flag script, and then I added the wind. I attached the windscreen. Yes. Right. Okay. Second thing to check is when you uh, set your windscreen to active, when you hit that checkbox and turn it on, does it look oh. correct on the screen? Uh, it looks correct, but it's not by the flag. Um, I don't know if I should move it over. So, but you can like see it on the screen and everything. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, so I'm actually surprised it's not working then. Um, let's see, what else could I check? It does make it harder if I can't see your screen. <laughs> I know. So uh... like it, on the game itself, in the game window, you, you can definitely see that windscreen showing up. Uh, I. When I clicked on it, the selected it, yes. When it's you hit there. the check box, the yeah. check mark on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, hmm. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> I wish I could share the screen with you. No, it's um, all good. <laughs> usually it's just something silly, but like, you know, it's hard for me to even uh, consider what could be silly without being able to look at hmm. your screen. Yeah. Uh, if you hit, um, 
Yeah, I don't know. Why don't we try this actually? This is good. This is good to learn some debugging. So if you go into your flag. Yeah. Oh, we actually already have that. In your console, when you touch the flag, is it saying uh, yeah. you won? Point collected. Oh, sorry, no. That's what that's what it's up now. Let me go and see. Hold on. So if you touch play. the flag, it should still say like you won or or whatever we wrote in there. Uh let me play it. Hold on. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Oh, by the way, a hot tip for that. Uh -huh. In your inspector, in the on the game window, at the top of the game window, there's like a line yeah. of buttons. There's like a scale and a free aspect, right? In yeah. The middle, there's a mute audio. Oh, I see. Yeah. Play audio. yeah. <laughs> Very okay. useful. When you're working um, on a game and you've heard the theme song 7,000 times. Right. <laughs> lifesaver. Oh, let's see. Uh, oh. Oh, you know what? It didn't come up. The the that you won. Hmm. Oh, that's perfect. Great, because that means that uh, the entire script is not working. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and it has the reason that that's good. We're narrowing down the problems, right? The reason that that's good is it means that the windscreen is set up correctly and like everything there is good. So we don't need to worry about it anymore. But obviously the script is for some reason not firing. My guess is you didn't attach a collider to your flag and mm -hmm. or you didn't set it to be a trigger. Oh, maybe, let's see. So your flag uh -huh. needs a collider and that collider needs to be set to be a trigger. Okay, trigger. All right, let me try. Sure. Are uh, Natalie and Kevin, you guys just hanging out and sort of absorbing or is there other oh. stuff you wanna ask about? <gasps> yeah. It came out. <laughs> just absorbing? Yay. Yeah, I'm just observing. Cool. All right, well then was there something else, Catherine? No, that's it, thank you. Okay, any last How things fun. from anyone? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, thank you so much for everything. I'm gonna join everything. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, please do. Um, so yeah, the you know I think the Discord is the big thing that I'd love to have you in. We literally only open this to give you guys perspective. Only open it to the public a month ago, so we've only just started allowing people in, and mostly we're allowing cool students in. So come in, nice. show off your work, take pictures of your weird Mario rolling around on the ground or whatever. <laughs> send gifts, uh, you know, we're trying to create a community of people. Um, what we are most explicitly trying to be, I, I love giving this lecture, so I'll leave you guys with this. Games I view, first of all, as just this next powerful, wonderful art form. They are still relatively unexplored um, compared to movies, books, all of those other ones, you know, they've had such a short period of time where they've actually existed. And so therefore there's so much that is still unexplored, uncreated in the world of games. So that by itself is exciting. But the other thing that I find more fascinating about games is that they're basically the study of human motivation. They're basically the study of how do I get somebody to do something that they totally don't have to do? Like, why is Mario going to get black? Who cares? Uh, and we typically use the motivation of fun, right? We typically use just like, this is fun, so I'm gonna keep doing it. But there are so many other parts to that. Accomplishment, socialization. There's so many other parts that actually lend to gamification and making a game interesting. So because of the study of human motivation, they have a tremendous level of power. And we've seen a lot of that in companies like Facebook who use it sort of abusively to try to get you to stay on the platform. And then other systems that use it better, one of my favorite examples is Wikipedia. They have their moderators spending hours and hours a day moderating and protecting that content, not because they're getting paid or because they're getting you know, recognition, but because they're freaking protecting the knowledge base of the human race because they're gamified. So I view games as an incredibly powerful art form, and with great power comes great responsibility, right? We all know that one too. So the Wizards of Joy and the Indie Game Academy, yes, it's about learning to make games. Yes, it's about building games together, but it's also about trying to positively impact the world with our games, even if that's just making some things around. All right? So hope to have you all there. See you there. And uh, thank you for coming. It's been a good thank one. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good Bye. night. Nice to meet you. Adios. Nice to meet you. Stay safe, everyone. Bye.